That's, uh, it's a DVB-T demodulator chip, is what it's obviously designed as uh, for the TV part of things. And, uh, but it also has an analog to digital converter in it for doing FM and uh, DAB. And the way it does that is it streams all the IQ samples to the PC. Um, so this, this is the bit that um, one of the Linux kernel developers noticed when he was writing the driver for this uh, stick and realized that this, combined with the fact that you can tune the front-end tuner to uh, a very wide range of frequencies, um, he thought, uh, there's a uh, cheap poor man's software radio here. Um, so what, what we have at the start is we have this E4000 tuner, which um, I'm sure any of you who've uh, done any research on this will have, uh, will have found out about. Uh, so that's, it's a tuner that can um, down-convert anything to fif from 50 to 2200 megahertz. Uh, it can down-convert uh, 24 megahertz of that at a time uh, down to baseband. And the idea is then that that can be sampled directly by the ADC that's in the Realtek chipset. Um, now the ADC only runs at 3.2 mega samples per second, so obviously we can't look at the full 24 megahertz, but uh, it certainly allows us to do quite a bit with it. Um, the, the real main key here and why the Realtek chipset is the only one that's supported is because this I2C control that controls the front end tuner is wide open to the driver. So uh, the Realtek chipset is currently the only one that's been found to do that. And that's why you can do it with this one. And I, as far as I'm aware, nobody's been able to do it with any other chipset. So the E4000 tuner that's in the front of it, uh, this is the rough layout of it. Um, it has simple preamp on the front. It's then got a uh, tunable CMOS filter. Uh, this is uh, something that um, is the main core of Elonic's intellectual property and uh, actually works uh, quite a bit better than any other one on the market. Um, this is uh, one of the big uh, things for getting the uh, one with the E4000 in it. Um, it uh, does seem to be a couple of dB better on the noise floor than anything else out there. Uh, that being said, it's not a great filter. Um, I've got a diagram of that later. Uh, so then it mixes it down to, uh, to baseband here and puts out the IQ samples. Um, it can do 50 to 2200 megahertz, but uh, because of the, a gap in how the PLLs work, uh, they, it won't do 1100 to 1250. Uh, that's something that varies with other models of tuner. Um, I'm not aware quite of what the others are, but I know the others have different gaps. So if this is what you're after, you may do better uh, looking at one with an alternative chipset that I'll look at later. Okay. Yeah, it may be this different chipset. Um, I haven't actually tried it in that gap, um, but... Uh, Certainly the data sheets talk about it, and it's the same uh, front end that's in the um, bunk cube as well. So it has pretty much the same capabilities as that. Uh, the ADC that's in the back, this is the, this is the thing to look for. Um, if you have a DVB-T stick at home that you want to see if it'll do this, uh, crack it open and look for this chipset with the crab symbol on it. Uh, if it's got one of those in it, it almost definitely can do it. Uh, if it hasn't, at the moment it can't. Uh, so it's designed as hardware DVB demodulator. Um, so that does all the DVB stuff actually on the chip, which is why you only get 3.2 megahertz out of it. You'd think being a TV chip, it would have a wider bandwidth for that, but this bit's only for the wideband FM and the DAB. Um, so actually, uh, 3.2 megahertz per second is pretty good for that. But the ADC in it's only 8 bits. It's designed to receive broadcast. So it's not designed for DX or low signal work. Um, it does seem to work reasonably well, though. Um, but of course, it doesn't have the uh, dynamic range that the, whoops, uh, that the Fun Cube dongle has. It only estimated at 48 dB. Um, it actually can be quite a bit less than that uh, because they, 
uh, I've, I've heard rumors that uh, they haven't matched up the voltage levels quite right in there. So actually, you only get about seven bits out of it. But I don't think anyone's verified that for sure yet. So a comparison to the architecture of the Funcube dongle. Um, Funcube has the E4000 tuner in the front. Um, and then it converts down to baseband. And then it uses this, which is an audio codec chip. So standard thing, what you get on a line in. Um, and then that uh, puts the PCM data to the PIC, which then puts it over USB. So the PIC doesn't actually do much apart from just interfacing. And the PIC also manages the I2C control of the E4000 here. Uh, this, of course, means that you only get uh, the audio bandwidth out of it, so 192 kilohertz for the newer one, or about uh, 96 kilohertz for the uh, original Pro version. Uh, so again, I'll put the uh, diagram of the RTL-SDR underneath the comparison. And uh, we can see that all the control and stuff is man managed by the 2832. And the key thing, another key thing is uh, the Funcube prides itself on not needing drivers because the, it's basically an audio interface as far as the computer is concerned. Um, the RTL-SDR, because it's transferring raw IQ samples, it actually does need the drivers. Um, but there's a whole range of open source drivers out there for both Windows and Linux. Uh, just a quick comparison against the Funcube. I put in a bit about this because I thought some of you probably do have the Funcube. Uh, so the bandwidth, obviously, the RTL-SDR has uh, quite a bit greater, but it does lose out on the uh, bits to do with each sample and the, therefore the uh, dynamic range. Um, the way people normally boost that is using an external uh, LNA or preamp, uh, which you can switch on and off to manage different signal levels. Uh, another thing to note is the crystal that's used in, in these. Um, the crystal that's in these, uh, the TV stick I've got here, I got for seven quid off eBay from China, including postage. So it doesn't use an expensive crystal at all. Um, the crystal in it's about 200 parts per million which can lead it to be many kilohertz out. Um, but uh, the SDR bit helps you to find the signal in the first place. So. Uh, th that can be calibrated um, and tends to be pretty stable per a dongle. Once, once it's warmed up a bit, it does have a bit of temperature change. But after that, uh, most of the software, you can actually put the calibration in. And it will hold within a few hundred hertz um, over a long period, so a week. Um, the Funcube gets this right where they, they used a slightly more expensive crystal in the first one, but the new Funky Dongle Pro uses a temperature compensated crystal, which obviously gets it far better accuracy. Uh, this could be something that uh, you could do to the uh, RTL-SDR. Uh, it's got 28.8 megahertz crystal oscillator in it. Um, so if you could put in something similar that was temperature compensated, then uh, you get far better accuracy out of it. Uh, the other thing to note is the price, and this is where these really come into their own, is they're only roughly £20. Um, they were cheaper than that. Supplies are now sort of starting to dry up a bit. Uh, so, sorry, I'm supposed to stand here, I think. Um, yeah, supplies are starting to dry up a bit, um, so they're getting a bit more expensive, but they're still a lot cheaper than the uh, fun cubes are. Uh, potential uses, anything the Funcube can do, really. So wideband FM, narrowband FM, SSB, all of that. Um, people have also built uh, Tetra demodulators, uh, P25, that kind of thing. But you can also do the wider bandwidth stuff. So ADSB is the uh, data downlink from planes for their GPS telemetry. So you can uh, receive them from, receive the uh, telemetry from the planes, and there's applications where you can build up the 3D maps of that. Uh, people have also built GSM sniffers um, just for the unencrypted stuff. Uh, there is an unencrypted mode to do with GSM, and you can uh, listen to that as well with the RTL-SDR. Uh, LTE, some people are starting to look at. Um, I think some people have captured some of the handshakes, um, but it does tend to force encryption, uh, so they haven't got too far with that. Uh, GPS, though. Um, so people have managed to receive the GPS satellites with it. And actually on the bottom here, uh, you've got, uh, this is a map someone made of them 
they pipe the output from the RTL-SDR into Octave, a mathematical modeling program, and built their own GPS demodulator off that. So that's software GPS demodulator using the RTL-SDR as a receiver. And as you can see, it's not too accurate. Uh, most of this is because of the frequency error in the crystal. Um, but it did pick their location out on a map, and they were somewhere in that building there. So it does work for that. Uh, software you can use for it. Um, most people tend to primarily use it on Windows, uh, just because that seems to be what most people use. Uh, SDR Sharp, which is this screenshot here, uh, this is the um, uh, this is uh, actually of the two meter SSB band during National Field Day. Uh, so it gives you a nice interface there. Uh, this software is open source and it's being actively developed. Um, the, uh, I've got a new version which I'm going to uh, demo in a moment, which is actually uploaded last night. Uh, they tend to release updates every couple of days with new new features. Um, and for the drivers on Windows, there's a little program called Zadig. You run it, uh, it um, comes up with a drop-down box, you select which USB port the dongle is plugged into, and then it installs the drivers automatically, you reboot, it works. Um, the one thing to note is it does conflict with the drivers that are used for the digital TV side of things. So um, if you want to use it for TV as well, then what you can do on Windows is plug it into a different USB port. And Windows manages the drivers per the USB port on the laptop. Um, so you can have one USB port for the RTL-SDR stuff and one USB port for the TV stuff. Um, it can be very confusing when you plug it into the wrong USB socket and it says drivers aren't installed. Um, but that's the way Windows works. Uh, for Linux, uh, most people tend to use GNU Radio, which is this software here. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of it, but it basically allows you to plug in your own filters, uh, demodulators, that kind of thing. And uh, it's a very powerful piece of software. Um, I'm meaning to uh, start learning to play around with it this year. So um, there's GQRX is the main Linux application. That's actually built on GNU Radio. So you need to install GNU Radio first, and then you run that. But it's got tons of demodulators in it. Uh, for all kinds of things. Um, I think there's some people trying to put stuff like Tetra demodulators straight into it. So you just click on Tetra signal and it sorts everything out for you. Um, and, then, uh, and then, of course, you can go into the source code, play around with it, change the parameters on all the filters, that kind of thing. It's very powerful once you start to get behind the scenes. Uh, there's another one for Linux, which is QT Radio, which is... Um, a piece of software that actually uses a server client kind of thing. So it runs a server on a computer with the SDR dongle plugged in. And then you start up a GUI client that connects to the server and manages the demodulation. Um, so one thing that they're looking at doing this uh, with this is uh, you can display it as a web interface and then connect to a server that does all the demodulation on that. Um, one thing people have looked into is using this dongle remotely. Um, there's a Linux program called RTL TCP that allows you to pipe the IQ samples over TCP. Um, this was originally designed for the Funcube dongle. Uh, for the RTL SDR, it does work, but only on your local LAN because you're piping it at um, quite a high speed. Um, I haven't actually tried it myself, but I'm guessing it, it's, it would probably max out 100 meg. Um, so... Yeah, I, I tend to just run it with uh, SDR Sharp, since this one's uh, improved. And uh, it's got a frequency manager that allows you to store frequencies. And um, using something like virtual audio cable, you can pipe the audio out of it into FLDG or something for receiving those kind of signals. Right, uh, time for the live demo. This is the bit where I hope it works. Oops. Okay, so that's uh, that's running there. Uh, let's see if we can find a signal.
Okay, this, uh, this signal, as you can just about see here, uh, is a high altitude balloon payload uh, that I put outside, and it transmits a radio teletype tracking signal. Um, it's, uh, it actually uses the ISM band for this, so it's only 10 milliwatts and doesn't appear to be coming through too strongly in here. But that's coming through there. And you can see that's, that's the SSB bandwidth, is the, uh, so you can change the audio filter bandwidth up here. And you can pull it right open to whatever you want. Or narrow it down so you just get that signal. Um, So in the whole scheme of things, uh, this, this isn't the highest uh, sampling rate that this will do. Um, unfortunately, the process is quite limited on my laptop, um, and it does tend to be quite processor heavy, especially when you're running the waterfall. Uh, so something to bear in mind if you're using a low, uh, low CPU laptop um, or your desktop isn't, isn't quite up to modern standards, um, you can change the... You can change the FFT depth uh, just here. So I've got that turned right up, so you can see it's quite nice, high-resolution waterfall. Um, obviously, it's a bit overloaded there, but you can change the contrast and the speed. And you can see that the SSB bandwidth that I was looking at is really invisible in the whole bandwidth that you can see. Uh, obviously, you can notice that there's a large spike in the middle here. Uh, this is the, um, the DC offset noise. Um, you've probably seen it in the funky dongle as well. It's far more pronounced in this, um, mainly because of the low quality crystal. Um, and uh, this software tends to uh, work quite well for um, cancelling most of it out. Actually there, yeah. I down, as I say, I downloaded the software version last night. Um, there's a little tick box here called Correct IQ. Uh, where it tries to correct the IQ imbalance, and it seems to have dipped slightly. Uh, it's certainly le looking less up there. And that, that works quite well in uh, looking at the IQ imbalance, and it uses a couple of algorithms to uh, sort that out. Uh, so that's looking at the two-meter band, um, and there's some signal that just went there. Uh, what, what I would like on this is something that you can uh, look at something that's a bit time-delayed, because... As you can see, that signal's just switched off, but I know it was there. If I could drag the cursor down a bit and listen to it again, that'd be nice. Um, I, I had a look at that, but I couldn't... I think Peter said it was 868. Ah, there we go. So that right there will be my radio mic. Okay. Uh, right, okay, you probably can't hear this. Um, let's see if that works. Uh, it is coming through. So there we are. That, that's it picking up my radio mic and then demodulating it and creating a very nice echo effect. And yeah, you can see there that you get a very nice, um, very nice FFT of the, the main carrier and a uh, couple of sidebands there as well. Oh, it's already one of the best demos I've seen, actually. Okay. Uh, so there's, there's lots of uh, different stuff you can play around with this. Uh, filter type. Um, you can change the uh, filter bandwidth, the filter order, that kind of thing. So quite a lot of them are grayed out. You can't do much when it's running. Um, but if I click stop up here, ah, oh, and then if I click to this mode, uh, quite a lot of it you can't change when the LTR, the RTL rather, is running. Um, 
because quite a lot of it involves playing around with actual uh, settings on the driver. Um, for changing the sample rate, you change it in here. So the, these are the sample rates available. Uh, you've got the 3.2, which is the, the maximum sample rate you can do. As I say, it doesn't work on here. It drops tons of samples. Um, I can get uh, two mega symbols on this one, but I have used 3.2 successfully on my desktop uh, in Linux, certainly. Um, if you, one thing to notice with the 3.2, uh, if I bring it up, actually, let's hope the laptop doesn't crash. So uh, it's dropping samples occasionally and you get some uh, bad imaging as well. But uh, the sensitivity, you can't see it as much here, uh, but the sensitivity actually tails off quite a bit at the ends. So certainly if you're using 3.2, it won't cover the full 3.2, uh, just because of the, um, the filters in the ADC cut it off a bit at the ends uh, to try and stop the ill effects. Uh, but there you can see the quite a bit of spectrum. Uh, as you can see, if, you, if I go in there now, as I just did before stopping it, it's grayed out. Uh, you can also play around with the um, AGC in here. Um, it comes pre-configured with the tuner ADC, um, AGC. I tend to put it on uh, manual um, because uh, there's quite a lot of pages around where I live. And I'll show you the front-end filter bandwidth in a moment, or some of you may have seen when I accidentally misclicked on the presentation. But uh, the filter bandwidth is very wide. So um, I actually I set up a two-meter APRSI gate with this. Um, I piped the audio from this into uh, one of the APRS applications and left it running for a while. It didn't do very well just because the sensitivity, whenever the pager fires up, uh, the tuner dropped the whole sensitivity. Uh, that was back when you couldn't configure this bit. Um, so I, I tend to leave it as manual, but uh, it does quite work quite well on automatic if there aren't many other signals around. Yeah, I, I've only got a tiny antenna on it at the moment. I've got this thing connected to it. So that's probably why it can't hear much. Oops. Ah, no one stand up. Ah, so as, as I said, uh, it, it says it's 325 there, but um, it's quite a bit off. And actually, that's quite, let's move that. Is it? Oh, right. Okay, that, that'll be why it sounds rubbish then. Yes. There you can see uh, you do get a bit, when it gets overloaded, you do get a bit of bad imaging and uh, that kind of thing. Okay, what, what's TV frequency? One, two, seven, four, two, six, eight. It's four mega symbols, so it's All right. 107. Yeah, again, I've only got a tiny antenna on this. No. I don't think the tiny antenna is doing me much favours on that. So some signal there. 
Is that uh, digital? Okay. Yeah, so it's getting a bit of that. Uh, connected to a large antenna, it does quite well. Uh, this one's just connected to a, a little, uh, this one's actually connected to the supplied uh, TV antenna, uh, which I've found works quite well for quite close range stuff, but as soon as you start getting far, further away, it doesn't. Um, there was, I think about a week or two ago, um, they implemented it so the whole of this was saved. Um, and then, of course, you got the, uh, you've got this frequency manager here, which you can set up with saved frequencies, and you can actually do whole groups and stuff. Um, yeah, I think about a week ago or two ago, they solved the uh, saving these here. Uh, this... Sorry. So that's the edge of something coming through there. Yeah, I, I think some of this may be, I've got the uh, FFT set up um, a, lot, a lot finer than I usually do. Um, so the, the CPU is probably struggling a little bit with this. Um, but as you can see, it produces nice, a nice waterfall, which is very easy for tuning into stuff. And um, what I do uh, for piping it to other applications is I have virtual audio cable installed, so I just select that as an output sound card, and then that pipes it straight into FL Digi, or something like that. Right, uh, any other questions about the program? All right. So, uh, question about installing drivers, Philip. I think. If you've run Zadig recently, they've yeah. tidied it up an awful lot in the last couple of weeks, actually. And yeah. Norman was having great problems, and I, I advised him to do the new download, and it went straight away, didn't it, Norman? Yeah, yeah I've, uh, I actually I was given a TV stick uh, by yourself yesterday to, uh, to try out, and I installed the drivers for it. So somewhere here I do have... I'll try to find where I unpacked it to. Okay. So this this is the uh, Zadig program, um, which if you go to the SDR Sharp um, web page, and then there's uh, if you go to downloads, there's a link to uh, SDR Sharp on Windows that explains the whole process with setting this up, um, and it links to this program, which starts up looking like this. And basically, to install the drives yesterday, all I had to do was go options, list all devices, and then it comes up there. And what you're actually looking for is bulk in interface zero. So if I click on that, um, and then you want to select Win USB here. And it probably won't come up. This will probably be blank. And you can see here it says reinstall. This drive's already installed for this. Question on that. Um, um, uh, one question on that. Uh, when I was trying to set this up over many, many weeks, I could never get the built in into uh, the uh, bulk IO to ever appear. It would recognize the device, but that it would never come up with that. And even with the latest version, it didn't. But what I've found, and I think Noel found the same thing that uh, if you just select the device, the actual RTL itself in there, then it does actually work. So, that, whereas originally when I tried that, it didn't. So something has actually changed there. But All right. So, but uh, yeah, the bulk, bulk IO, IO one never did appear. Okay, so what, what did, you, did it come up as sort of named as a... It actually came TV? up as the uh, named device uh, as, had, as had RTL. You had you installed the drivers for the TV part of it before? No. Oh, okay. No. Um, and it, uh, but um, yeah, no, I hadn't actually done that. At least 
I had manually done it, whether, whether Windows had actually tried to do something, I don't yeah. know, but uh, I don't think it had. It, that sounds a bit like Windows might have tried to install the uh, drivers for the TV side, uh, maybe it had them built in. And so therefore this saw that, oh, those devices were already tied up with this driver. Um, Perhaps. On an earlier attempt, I even rebuilt the machine so it's clean and it still just, it ne just never came up with the bulk I.O. But so the latest version, the device was actually listed, select that, worked, looked like a dream. So okay. um, it seems the installation has changed a little bit there. Okay, right. Um, yeah, the, certainly when I uh, started doing this, when I got my first one, uh, this utility wasn't around, and I remember it being about three or four programs to try and get it installed. And you had to, uh, at one point, there was a list of about seven of these, and the instructions were, try this one, reboot, does it work? Try this one, reboot, does it work? And it took absolutely ages. Um, I installed for a couple of sticks uh, last night, and uh, this was all I had to do. But um, if you do have any problems, then you can try Googling them. There's plenty of other people out there trying to install these. And uh, someone's probably come across the problem somewhere. And a, a question, Philip, about obviously it was meant for DVBT. Are there any QPSK demodulators about, or anybody working on that? Um, well, the, the DVBT is built into the Realtek chipset and actually it's, uh, it's completely separate from uh, what we're using here. Um, so we, do, we don't actually use any of the DVB stuff at all on that side of the chip in this. We just use that ADC that's designed for the FM and DAB. Uh, right. I, uh OK, uh, I'll quickly run through this because the screen's flashing at me. Um, this is the uh, two meter band during National Field Day. Uh, this was uh, it, Saturday evening when it got quiet and just before every, everyone came back from the pub. Um, the, I, I plugged it in to see what we could see and basically went through looking at because I could see all the stations that were calling, clicking on them, writing down their call sign. Um, that, that worked quite well. We managed to find, I think it was one of these uh, we hadn't talked to. Um, I had planned to get sort of a dual setup with it running at the rig at the same time so I could scan the band while they were listening to people on the radio. We didn't manage to get that set up, but I thought this was one of the potential uses of it. Uh, this is the front end filter graph. Um, I don't, I'm quite new to radio and stuff, uh, but that doesn't look like a very good filter compared to some I've seen. Um, so quite often people suggest putting uh, a saw filter on the front if you're using it for a specific application. Uh, this is what's been done with the Funky uh, Pro Plus. Um, because obviously if you've got a signal 50 megahertz away and it's only 1 dB down, it's not going to do much good for your sensitivity. Uh, Add-ons. Um, this is a HF up converter that you can buy on eBay. Very simple construction, probably a lot cheaper to make yourself. Um, and that was actually just powered by the USB off the 5 volts. Um, and that just up converts HF to 100 megahertz so that um, you can then, so the E4000 then down converts it. There's another way you can do it, which is plugging straight into the front of the E4000. Um, but uh, I've heard of a lot of people frying the chips, managing to do it, trying to do it that way. Um, mainly because they, uh, it's designed to be internal within the circuit, so nothing static protected or anything in there. Uh, but that may be another way you can do it. Uh, this is a quick photo of, um, this is uh, something that I'm putting together at the moment for the ballooning stuff. Uh, it's up in the ISM band, there's lots of high signals around there, especially when a local amateur starts up with 400 watts of um, FM. Uh, it doesn't do much good to try and, trying to uh, receive this 10 milliwatt signal. Uh, so this actually has a saw filter in the front, which is has that's the uh, response of the um, of this thing. Um, saw filter in the front, and then a preamp just to boost our pass band by 20 dB, and that works very well. Uh, we can't tell the difference between an FT790 and an RTL SDR dongle on the same antenna. Uh, in fact, the RTL SDR appears to work better in certain applications, in certain uh, situations rather. Uh, quick useful tips. Um, 
when, if you buy these off eBay, uh, quite a lot of the lower cost ones certainly don't have the static protection diode installed. Uh, it's just a little anti-parallel diode job that stops the input from rising too high. Uh, quite a lot of them don't have it installed. You plug it into your collinear on your roof, 10 minutes later, the waterfall just goes black. And that's your front end uh, being fried. And unfortunately, you have to buy a new dongle or solder on this chip yourself, but it's probably easier to buy a new dongle. Uh, the BAV 99, which is sold at Farnell, is a suitable replacement for that. Um, and it's a little surface mount job, but uh, it's only three well spaced pads, so it's quite easy to solder on. Uh, crystal temperature. I was listening to a data signal from a balloon. This is telemetry coming in. And the signal was doing this. Turned out it did it whenever a crosswind came across my desk and went through the holes in the case. So it's cooling the crystal and um, changing the frequency quite a bit. Obviously, this is only 50 hertz at 480 megahertz. Uh, so that's where the crystal accuracy uh, doesn't do us much favors. Uh, so I've had, what I tend to do is wrap mine in tape. Don't insulate it too much. I tried that immediately after this, and the signal gradually faded out. Took the insulation off, let it cool down, signal came back. So it doesn't like high temperature either. Uh, USB extension cable, quite often uh, just spacing these away from the computer can do quite well because uh, especially if you're using it with a laptop, the metallic coating inside isn't that great. So just getting the receiver a bit further away from the laptop with an extension. Some people have also found uh, putting a ferrite clip on the cable also helps. Uh, they're available from eBay for about £20 now. There's some alternative tuner chips here. Um, they don't tend to work quite as well as the E4000s, just tend to be a couple of dBs down, and they don't have the same ranges, so that's something you need to check uh, if it matches. But these tend to be a lot more cheaper, a lot cheaper, because Elonix that make the E4000 have recently gone to liquidation, hence they had to make the new Pro Plus one cube dongle. Uh, beware of scam sites. I bought one off a Chinese supermarket website, which turned out to be a complete clone of another website. Um, luckily, I paid through PayPal, and so when I asked the guy for the money back, he said, it's on the way, but here's your money back. I never got it. So he was just trying to persuade me not to uh, take my money back. But uh, there are a few scam sites around selling them. eBay is probably the safest way to get them. And uh, more information, uh, Osmocom, uh, these are the guys who um, do quite a bit of uh, open source SDR with FPGAs. They're the guys who originally developed the drivers for this. Uh, so when they found out about it, they jumped straight on it, did all the first Linux drivers. Uh, Reddit, um, there's quite a few posts, posts here about what new people, what people are doing new with the dongle. And then uh, RTL SDR on Freenode IRC. Also, there's people always discussing it. There's plenty of people hanging around in the channel who probably got answer to any technical issues you're having. And I'll be posting the uh, slides and where I got all the information up on my website there. Any questions? Yes. Um, the, I haven't seen any going for bidding. They tend to be buy it now ones. Yes, yeah. Um, and quite often you'll see two prices. Um, the cheaper one is the one where the postage isn't included. Yes, yeah. Um, and there's a guy, you can either order it about three pounds cheaper from China and wait three weeks, uh, or you can pay the extra three pounds and you order it from a guy who's in mainland UK and you'll get it within a couple of days. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Philip. We're uh, running a little bit behind, so I think we'll uh, cut it there. Philip's out here. He's got uh, a demo running, so uh, but really fascinating. I've got a couple of them. Apparently, uh, this particular one hasn't got the uh, diode fitted, but um, they're, uh, they're great fun. And uh, I think it, the aerial that's supplied with it isn't a fair demonstration. Certainly, I can hear uh, the Farnham repeater 15, 20 miles away just on a, a dipole in the loft. So... Uh, they are, they are pretty useful, and, and the great thing is just to see the waterfall, you can just click on a signal and go to it, and it uh, works really well. So thank you very much, Philip. And so now we're going to move on to uh, DigiLite. Brian, where are you? Oh, yes.
Very good. Okay. And as promised, we have the student on at 9.30.